Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Marhaban bikum. Assalamu alaikum. Very good morning to you all for the events of our second day of the Knowledge Summit 2019, which is organized by Muhammad Bar Rashid uh, Knowledge Foundation under the title of uh, Knowledge for Sustainable Development. Uh, we continue our sessions uh, to covering the themes of our summit. And the first uh, session, uh, we host Mohammed Al Burai, the managing director of the Dubai Real Estate Institute, and the, uh, Professor Jason Pomeroy, founder of Jason Pomeroy Studios, Karim Al Jisser, executive director, SEE Institute, the Sustainable City Dubai, Stephen Haggart, founder of Aust Australis, moderator Sally Musa, talking about innovation, the way to sustainable cities. Uh, kindly join us on the stage. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Knowledge Summit 2019, organized by the Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum Knowledge Foundation. My name is Sally Musa, host of Life Beats on Pulse 95 Radio, and I'm excited to be bringing you this morning's session, Innovation, the Way to Sustainable Cities. I remember only a few years ago, it used to be that sustainable cities were this far off idea in the future, too expensive, too difficult to do. But now, as we approach a population of 9.8 billion by 2050, and the mounting climate change challenges that we are facing today, sustainable living is actually becoming the only way to live. And today we are presenting you with an illustrious panel of some of the world's leading thinkers who are most passionate about transforming the cities of the future. Now here we have a second uh, from your right there, Jason Pomeroy, an award-winning architect, academic, author, TV presenter, and one of the world's thought leaders in sustainable design. His career spans Europe, the Middle East, and Asia, including a number of notable projects, including the first zero carbon house and zero carbon community in Asia and Indonesia's Silicon Valley. He is the founder of sustainable urbanism, architecture design and research firm Pomeroy Studio and sustainable education provider Pomeroy Academy. He's the author of Idea House, Future Tropical Living Today, The Sky Court and Sky Garden, Greening the Urban Habitat, The Pod Off Grid, Explorations into Low Energy Waterborne Communities, and he's working on another book, which we're going to ask him about soon. Jason also works to raise awareness of the cultural role that architecture plays in society through TV, Smart Cities 2.0, City Time Traveller, City Redesign, and Futuropolis, please welcome Professor James Pomeroy. Right next to him is uh, Dr. Mohammed Al Burai, Global Advisor to the UN Cities Program and Vice President of the International Real Estate Federation. And uh, he is also on the advisory committee of affordable housing at the World Economic Forum. And before that, he served as chairman of the UN Global Compact UAE and represented the MENA region on its advisory board. He's worked across sustainable development goal initiatives, including Youth Ambassadors Program, Women Empowerment Principles Platform, and SDGs Pioneers. Recently, Dr. Mahmoud established the Middle East Sustainable Development Institute to lobby stakeholders into action on SDGs in the Middle East. Please welcome Dr. Mahmoud Al Burai. Thank you. Thank you. Right here next to me, Karima Jusser, who has 20 years of experience in resource management, climate change, and urban development based at Dubai's very own sustainable city. He currently manages the C Institute, a global platform for advancing knowledge in sustainability and the built environment. The Institute uses the sustainable city to deploy its programs, test emerging technologies, and explore new urban trends. He's currently establishing the Diamond Innovation Center, a multidisciplinary organization which promotes low carbon and living through innovation and partnerships. Please welcome Karim Al-Jusser. 
And last but certainly not least, Stephen Haggard is the founder of Australis, a seasoned entrepreneur with over 30 years of experience developing new technologies and major multi-use property projects around the world, particularly in Asia. Australis is currently planning the first ever World Eco Expo in Australia in 2022, a platform for exploring sustainable development goals over six months with 50 countries. And prior to Australis, Stephen created a portfolio of multi-billion dollar developments on the Gold Coast as CEO of the RDG Property Group, including the $1.2 billion dual hotel and residences. He's also now spearheading the Co-Creative Hubs initiative to develop a global network of collaborative facilities based on a shared set of values intended to help co-create humanity's positive future. Please welcome Stephen Haggard. Now, gentlemen, today we are going to be exploring the cities of the future with you, but for us to understand a little bit more about your background in this particular area, I would love so much for each of you to talk about why you are so passionate about sustainability and where that's taken you in your work today. Let's start with you, Dr. Mahmoud al -Baray. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, I don't know if we're lucky or not lucky, but we're part of the Arab countries or Arab nations that has a lot of political, economic, social, and environmental challenges that makes sustainability as a pressing issue that we need to tackle at all levels. If we talk about Politically, we're in a region that has 20 out of 60 million refugees who are an Arab origin. If we talk about socially, we have one of the highest illiteracy rates, about 27% of the Arab people or population are illiterate. If we talk about environmentally, then nine out of 10 people in the Arab region are breathing unsafe air. So to sum it up, we really need urgent action. We have almost even less than 4,000 days to act on sustainable development goals. And if we don't take a multi-stakeholder systematic approach to this, we will lag behind as we are lagging behind in so many uh, aspects. And personally speaking, and I don't know if you allow me, just briefly, and I think Sally, you were expecting me to share a little bit about personal yes. story. Personal story, I was born as a refugee, 1983. I was born in a Jabali refugee camp in Gaza and Palestine. And believing in education and investing in education, being a refugee, the only way to get out of this refugee camp is to invest in my education and do well in my education. Finished high school with the highest rank among my peers, and I got a call from Dubai from His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, our visionary leader, that we have all the respect and admiration, asking me to come here to Dubai to invest in my education, support me, me all the way from my bachelor degree to all the way to four master degrees and a PhD in sustainable competitiveness until I started also my own think tank. So I'm very uh, grateful to the great leaders of the United Arab Emirates, the Hazina Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum. And his, this is his foundation, and this is the conference that we have today as part of his foundation. He has done so much to the Arab region. He has done so much to the Arab youth. We look at the United Arab Emirates as an example of a country that's investing too much in the youth in the Arab region. And I hope that I become one of the soldiers that also pay something back to the community and to the Middle East. Absolutely. Absolutely. Incredible. You. you have an incredible story and so much respect to you. Um, uh, talk to us a little bit more about uh, you now working you know, within the government. Let's take that perspective a little bit. And with your research, Dr. Mahmoud, around uh, sustainable cities as well. Sure. If you allow me to use my presentation. Yes, please. Sure. Go ahead. I'll be quick. So just 10 minutes. Stop me anywhere. I timed it this way. You can't stop me anywhere. Okay, so, Assalamu alaikum again. United Nations Global Compact Cities Program is a program that's focusing on the four circles of sustainability. And I'm very proud to be part of the global advisors on this. We measure cities based on four circles of sustainability, economic, uh, politics, culture, and ecology. 
cities face all kinds of challenges that goes from economic, social, political, environmental challenges. We have a lot of 33 mega cities that has a population of over 10 million people. We have demographic shift, we have environmental challenges, we have crisis, we have political unrest. We have all kinds of challenges that needs from us urgent and also at radical changes in the way and new paradigms of solving sustainability challenges. As we are reaching 9 billion population, this pressure a lot on the city's infrastructure and services. And as a government uh, policy makers, we need to rethink the way we plan, the way we develop our cities. So, I mean, 836 million people still living in poverty, 828 million people living in slums, and we see them from our nice looking views. Cities now are going underwater. Recently, as you, you've heard in the news, Venice, 80% of it is underwater. Jakarta now is, not being, is now being moved, so the capital of Indonesia is going to be moved as the city sinks about 25 centimeter, sorry, 2.5 centimeter on a yearly basis. I met Lee Kuan Yew, the Prime Minister of Singapore, the founder of Singapore, and I asked him about the developing cities and Dubai, and what do you think of what we're doing? And he triggered me to actually to do my PhD on sustainable competitiveness. He said, you're doing great, but I'm always worried about the sustainability of such booming city. So looking into the sustainability of what we're doing, we may also go through crisis and recession, but we always look at the crisis as what Chinese look at the crisis. It's a combination of two things. It's danger, but it's also opportunities. So how we rethink sustainable competitiveness because of the crisis, the challenges we're facing, the trust in global system is going down. This requires new types of leaders, system leaders, leaders who think beyond their area of expertise to beyond that, to think of how different system overlap, interact, and how this will impact the sustainability of cities. Dynamism and adaptability are very important competitive sources of competitiveness that we need to build within the DNA of our government policy making. Resilience is important as systems becoming our interdependent, the growth we're having is pushing our systems into fragility that requires from us to build resilience within the system. And this is the model that we came up with in, from meeting 200 real estate stakeholders and city stakeholders. This is the model that we came up with. The three major pillars of sustainability are quality of life, and this includes economic, social, environmental aspects, Government and resilience. Government is a central pillar in driving sustainability agenda. And government has been always looked at as a trusted partner, a trusted stakeholder that should be there to push the sustainability agenda. And last but not least, affordability. We need to, uh, to build affordable city. And by that, we're not only talking about affordable housing. We're talking about affordable housing, affordable education, affordable health, affordable shopping, affordable life. And this requires delivery platforms, stakeholders engagement all the way, system leadership, governance, transparency, technology. And we always look at the technology as an enabler to drive innovation, to drive uh, technology, and to drive sustainability. How much time do I have? OK. So you stop me anytime you want. From research findings, we found that people look beyond buildings. They look at the community where they're living. They look at the city the infrastructure, the assets of the city. What does the city have to offer them? And this is what Jan Yehel said. A good city is like a good party. People stay there longer than necessary because they are enjoying themselves. So how we build a city that's enjoyable, that's like attending a good party. It's like what also uh, Patrick said. A city is more than a place in a space. It's a drama in time. Government is important, peace and security are important. Leadership, again, we always re-emphasize the, the leadership role in pushing sustainability and in pushing economic growth. Affordable housing is an important part of driving sustainability agenda. We've been doing a lot of research on how we drive affordable, how we drive houses uh, prices down, how we invest in new technologies that bring houses prices down and people's right to the city, 
all these are important concepts we're working on and happiness and Sheikh Mohammed has been always pushing us to think of happiness what we're doing is a re the reason we're doing real estate development the reason we're building the city we want people to come and live happily in Dubai and in the region so happiness is the meaning and the purpose of the whole and the whole aim of a human existence and what Plato said a city is what it is because our people are what they are. So how we build human-centric city, how we build happy city. Minister of Happiness is doing a lot of work on how we create happy communities. And these are the criteria of how we make happy communities. Connectivity, infrastructure, location, culture, smart, and lively places. They're all ingredients of what makes happy city. Walkable, bikeable. All these are important pillars of building social sustainability and social cities that we want to live in. Visiting Scandinavian countries recently, I had an opportunity to visit three of them. And I got to buy this book that says the almost nearly perfect people. It talks a lot about happiness and happy city. So they referring to happiness that it's related to the context, it's to, related to the history. And it talks a lot about what makes those guys and the Nordic cities are the happiest because they lower their expectations. Uh, Denmark used to be a kingdom that has so many cities, but over so many countries, but over time they're starting losing country by country. So they reach a conclusion that we should be happy with what we have. And this is the source of happiness in there. How we build cities that are kids friendly. This is also important, safety and security. And today, as you know, we have all the schools closed because we care about safety of kids, right? Although it didn't rain as heavy as we expected. But it always reminds us that we have a great nature that we have to take care of. And if we take care of our nature, it will take care of us back. And if we ruin it, it will ruin us back. I want to finish with this, so I leave more time. Enrico is the and has been actually the mayor of uh, Bogota in Colombia. He has been always about happy city and happy communities. And, ha and he asking him recently, we met in London School of Economics event, and he said, Mahmoud, there are two tests that you have to do as a mayor or as a government official. One is the supermarket test, and one is the bicycle test. The supermarket test, when you go to the supermarket, meet with people, ask them what they want. What is the city that they want to live in? What kind of city? What kind of characteristics? And also the, uh, the bicycle test, you need to have a city that's bikeable. And research has been actually indicating that bikeable city, walkable city, people live happier in them than in city that's car dependent. Today, Karim was saying about the sustainable city in Dubai. We're so proud to have the city in Dubai. Half of the students live within the community and they can walk and they can bike to the school. So this is the kind of city we want. This is the kind of community we want. We want and this also has a health issue. We are in a country that 60% of population here in the UAE are overweight. And this is because we walk less, we bike less, we exercise less. So we need to rethink the way we plan, the way we design our cities, um, right? Build a social city, look at the international examples. We want a city for people and we should look at the different system, how they really cater to this. We need a city ta that build curiosity, trust, cooperation, movement of people, trusting city, because coming across stranger makes us happier, and this is from research. I don't want to take more of your time, so uh, that was I'll be Thank free you so to much, answer Dr. questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think um, that kind of leads us very nicely into your work, Professor Jason, um, because this is a, a lot of the stuff that you talk about as well that you have discovered. You yourself coming from um, a, a multicultural background, being yeah. half Malaysian, half English, yeah. um, you know, you were seeing two different aspects and that led you into your work. So yeah. talk to us about that. Um, I don't have any slides, oh. <laughs> so so what I, mine. What, what I need you to do is just kind of uh, picture something in your head, okay? So when I was uh, eight years old, so I'm, as you rightly pointed out, I'm half English, half Malaysian. Uh, my mother, Malaysian, she moved over to England, met my English father there, 
And from a very young age, I was always kind of passionate about going outside and playing in the back garden. So picture this, eight-year-old kid running around in a London home with a back garden, getting down and dirty with the kind of creepy crawlies and the worms and the ants and enjoying nature. Now, uh, fast forward a few years uh, to the time that I went to university. And what I just want you to do for one second is first of all, close your eyes and think about the Alaskan glaciers. Okay, so all of you, close your eyes. Think about how cold and beautiful those Alaskan glaciers would have been. At that time, I was about eight years old, running around in my mother's, father's back garden. Now forward to the point when I was 18 years old and open up your eyes and think of the heat that is transforming those Alaskan glaciers to the point that all of that snow and ice is effectively melting away into what is arguably a lush green landscape, but the cataclysmic effects of climate change is drastically altering the space that we're in. So when I went to university to study architecture, I was very passionate about trying to retain that sense of sustainability and in terms of trying to retain the sense of preserving nature. But what I've really come to realize is that the triple bottom line that we all know, the social, the economic, the environmental, as lucidly put forward by Doctor here, that's fine and well. That's understood. It's become common practice. But it doesn't go far enough, my friends. I mean, the triple bottom line also needs to be having three further, pi further pillars, culture, space, and technology. Why do I say that? Well, we're living in an increasingly multicultural setting. There is an increasing transmigration around the world where people are seeking refuge or seeking prosperity. And it's a lovely story that you mentioned about your own journey. A cultural sustainability is key for us to preserve ourselves from the wake of globalization, Coca-Cola culture, Instagrammable moments. Spatial sustainability is equally important. We cannot possibly have a conversation about social sustainability and our interactions on this stage or our interactions afterwards over a coffee. We can't have that conversation without space. Ultimately, spatial sustainability is about preserving space for our own interaction. Sky courts, sky gardens, sky terraces in high density cities that are increasingly becoming put under pressure through urbanization and densification. And technological sustainability. We need to use technology sparingly and wisely. And it's, it should be technology that is useful for the six-year-old child all the way through to the 70-year-old. You know, we get so caught up in technology that we lose sight of the ease of use. We need to be able to embrace technology in a sparing way that will actually help our lives as opposed to causing more problems. So in my green journey, I think it goes beyond just the environmental sustainability. It goes beyond the triple bottom line. I think it's increasingly important for us to bear in mind a cultural, spatial, and technological sustainability. And only then are we able going to be able to shape a greener future. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Stephen, I want to come to you now. You are very much somebody who uh, talks about uh, echoing, in fact, what Jason and Dr. Mahmoud have been saying, that we need a mindset change. This is where it all starts. So talk to us about what that means exactly. Yeah, I was just reflecting on um, my journey to here, and it's been one of uh, sort of following the bouncing ball of curiosity and looking at things in the broadest possible context. So it started off uh, with architecture and, and uh, becoming an architect, and then recognizing that there were many other influencing factors on architecture, and so then got into property development because money seemed to always influence the outcome. Uh, engineering materials did as well. And then I started looking at the 
the utilities and the broader impacts on the development of energy and food and water and waste. And so things for me in terms of following this bouncing ball of curiosity have always been about expanding um, the terms of reference or the context for something. And it's been expanding uh, ever wider until we're now creating this, uh, what we call a global visionary network, which is looking uh, beyond just built forms and built um, platforms to bring people together, but also digital platforms to bring people together, and also the technologies that are going to support humanity move into this new paradigm. So sustainability for me um, is an older term. Resilience started to come up, but then really regenerating um, the environment and our culture is, has become more the centre stage. So sustainability for me implies more of a keeping the status quo the way it is. We already know from the Sustainable Development Goals and many other reports that everything's degrading or degre degradating and, and it's um, in a state of collapse. So to, to maintain the status quo is no longer good enough. Yeah. Uh, being resilient, yes, is again about kind of maintaining a status quo, but moving to uh, regenerate. I mean, if we can create physical places, uh, communities that are starting to rebuild the environment, the culture, the systems, is really where my focus has, has been for the last few years. Absolutely. Um, and Karim, I want to come to you now. You're somebody who's been very much behind uh, the sustainable city here in Dubai, in the UAE, and it's an incredible, incredible development. Um, I remember four years ago, five years ago, that was just all desert, driving past it, and I saw a sign, the sustainable city. You've got to tell us how that all came about, because it, it was a tough journey to get that established, but you've achieved so much in such a short period of time. So take us through that story. So I will, and I will, I will go back uh, a couple of years uh, to say that, first of all, I'm, I'm half Lebanese, half Danish. Uh, so Denmark comes up a lot in the, uh, in the narrative about happy cities, etc. So I grew up in Denmark, and, uh, and that's where Closing the tap and recycling your paper and biking to uh, to your neighbor uh, is is second nature, right? And I could not actually conceive of a lifestyle without, you know, opposites to what I was doing. By 1993, I, I moved back to Lebanon at the end of the conflict in Lebanon, and I was I was determined to study environmental s environment, right? So if you wind back the clock, if you go back to 93, around this period. There was no such thing as, as uh, climate change, we didn't talk about it, resilience, forget it, you know, there was none of that. So I was looking for something which is as close to the topic as possible, and there were very few universities in Europe that offered environmental studies. That's what it was called 25 years ago, environmental studies. So I went to the American University of Beirut, and they didn't have environmental studies, although they are a progressive institution, so the second best for me was agriculture. So I, I became an agriculture engineer because I believe that by understanding, appreciating agriculture, you really understand cycle, circularity, nutrient cycling, uh, topsoil. You know, soil is so precious. And you mentioned sand, so I'm going to go back to sand now in the desert. So that's, that's what I studied. By the time I graduated, they introduced at the master's level an interfaculty program which combined engineering, uh, health sciences and environments. And so those three came together. So then I, I'm, I'm now an environmental scientist. I worked for 15 years or so in consultancy. And so my, my journey to Dubai was really going from Denmark to Lebanon to Dubai. I'm, I'm moving east. <laughs> and, uh, and the reason why I, I, I came here is because I worked 15 years in conservation. So for those of you who work in conservation, uh, you know, hats off because we we are faced by an onslaught of, of builders and industry and mining and, and all that nature that we treasure so much is disappearing, I mean, worldwide, including Lebanon and the Arab world. And the Arab world obviously is facing great, great, great challenges. And so I, was, I, felt, a bit, um, I felt a bit down. You know, I felt I was losing the battle. I wasn't able to achieve much. So I said, instead of fighting the cities, let's join the cities. So that's how I came to Dubai. 
And Dubai is really that space where we can think about the future and plan it. And I met the, the CEO of, of Diamond Developers, who was who had just received the approvals from the land department to build a sustainable city. That was in 2014. And to me, great, a sustainable city in Dubai. Let's join the builders, the polluters, right? Let's join that team and try to make a difference from within. So that brought me to sustainable city. And yes, absolutely, at the time, this was a desert. But let's, again, let's appreciate the desert as well. The desert is a beautiful ecosystem, and we should uh, we should also value the desert because that's part of the value system and the culture and the history of this part of the world. And so we started plowing the land, excavating in 2014. Fast forward, we now have 3,000 people living in Sustainable City. If can I can, we, just can we get it up? Can image. we get the, the image of the Sustainable City up? So we have 3,000 people living there. And clearly the challenge for all of us is how do we, how do we replicate that and offer this kind of living and lifestyle to 30,000 people, to 300,000 people, to 3 million people. This is how the sustainable city looks today from, this, from, from an aerial drone. So I wanted to show this picture because for us, uh, sustainability, and yes, today the narrative has evolved so much. Again, I think 1993 when we didn't have all these offerings. Today it's a sponge city, it's a resilient city, it's a green city, eco city, happy city smart city, and it's a sustainable city. So many philosophies come together. But if we want to simplify, I think we sh all of us, government, private, industry, etc., regulators, students, we always have to recognize the three pillars of sustainability. And we cannot achieve sustainability if we just focus on one. And it's very tempting for us to focus on one. I'm engineers, or we're the happy people, or we're the sellers. Well, we have to focus on the social, the environmental, and economic at the same time. And this opens up infinite opportunities. How do we bring those together under one space? So this is a 46-hectare community, but we need, to, we need to achieve these same goals at the level of Dubai, which Dubai is striving to do, at the level of the UAE, at the level of the GCC, at the level of the Arab world. So that picture, I think, captures many components in the sustainable city, the farming, that experience, that social glue, which is the, the spine, the green spine of the city. The clusters are small in size, so we create a sense of community. They are car free, so people can play outside and meet and greet their neighbors. The parking areas, that's the utility for us. This is where all the solar production offsets the electrical power consumption at the community level in the public space. So the, we separate the cars from the people and we have the individual units. And by looking at that space, the challenge, how do we densify this? By consuming less land, we need more people to live and achieve sustainability. And how do we make it more affordable, as we, as we just heard? How do we make this attainable, achievable to any income level? So this, by Dubai standards, would be considered middle plus. Well, we need to achieve middle, middle minus, lower income. Sustainab sustainability is not for the rich. It has to be for all of us. So it's been a journey, and my, my role today is to capture all the data, to support sustainability with numbers, to, to benchmark it, to challenge the regulation. We provide professional training. We have a business incubator, which is starting next week, to support startups, uh, entrepreneurs who have great ideas and products and solutions in sustainability. So. This picture, I think, conveys the message that the sustainable city is a living laboratory. And Dubai as well, is, in many ways, is a living laboratory for testing future technologies, systems, and relationships. And this is definitely a space where, um, y you know, as Dr. Mohammed was, was talking about, you, you do see people biking to school, kids biking to school. You see people walking all the time, um, you know, in, enjoying the outdoors. This is all part of it, enjoying uh, the outdoor spaces. I want to come to you, uh, Jason, back to you again, because this is something you talk about a lot, the importance of those public spaces that tend to disappear as we see denser and denser cities. Why is that so important? Why do we need to bring it back? And how do we innovate to bring that back? Right. I mean, I'm all, I'm all for technology when it's used wisely. And, um, you know, hands up here who has a smartphone. 
I mean, virtually everybody, right? And I'm sure you all kind of FaceTime with friends and family, and that has become this kind of default sense of communication. And if we're not careful, we all kind of vanish into this virtual realm. We all end up kind of living this kind of virtual life. If we're not careful, and research at Stanford and Columbia University has shown that we've only got another 20 years before we lose those basic elements of communication. How do we kind of meet and greet in public? What we need to ensure is that people get the chance to step back outside into the great outdoors and try and be social. So there's sociability to a certain extent through the internet, through WhatsApp and FaceTiming, but we sometimes lose those kind of rules of engagement, the ability to interact in public. So couple that with technological advancement with the fact that cities are increasingly becoming dense. 70% of the world population living in city centers by 2050. High-rise development becoming this de facto kind of way of creating density, which it doesn't need to be. But when you look at cities like Hong Kong, Tokyo, Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, the tall building as a symbol of power, prestige, opulence, and high density needs to be balanced with open space. Otherwise, we're just going to be retreating into our phones, retreating into retail malls, retreating into the <coughs> cinema. We need to be able to step outside, socially interact, and treat these sky courts, sky gardens, sky terraces as new alternative social spaces for us to interact. And hopefully, when you start bringing greenery into these spaces, you're going to have all the environmental benefits of that. Reduced ambient temperatures, absorbing rainwater, taking out noxious pollutants from the atmosphere, and hopefully creating a more greener and more pleasant environment to be living in. Green spaces also have a, a huge benefit to our own mental well-being. Just simply seeing green. Right, so there's, there's this research by a guy called Roger Ulrich, yeah. and he basically got 20 students to sit in a room watching a horror movie and they had them wired up with these heart monitors and every time there was this kind of scary scene everybody's heart rate would jump up so you can imagine that he was kind of creating a sense of anxiety by getting these students to watch the horror movie and then afterwards he got them to look at a city skyline and he measured the time the heart rate returned to normal he then did the same exercise with another horror film, I would imagine. But he got them to look at a green scene afterwards. And the heart rates returned to normal far quicker by looking at greenery. I mean, there is so much research to show the relationship between our health, well-being, and sociability in greenery, uh, as opposed to being just living in an urban environment. It so I think we do need to create that balance. Right. It is not just a nice to have, but actually it's vital. And what I find interesting, uh, Karim, you know, in a place like the sustainable city, the way, it's very green. You go there and it is very green, but actually uh, you guys are so smart about using the grey water to create that incredible green area. We live in the desert. So, you know, sometimes you think, oh, how much water is going into all of this to create the green spaces that we crave? But actually there are smarter ways of doing it. So, uh, many visitors uh, come to Sustainable City and expect to see uh, little greenery because yeah. they associate sustainability with no landscaping. Uh, obviously that's not true. And, uh, but the challenge for us is how do we, well we have other pictures, but how do we provide that greenery at minimal cost and impact to the planet? So we live, we're fortunate to live now in, 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 in Dubai, meaning Dubai municipality has the infrastructure in place to treat most of the wastewater that we produce, which originally came from desalination, from Diwa, right? And, and then to return it to us. So we do have a grey water system where we capture grey water separated from black water, but we also have treated sewage effluent, which is coming from the utility from Dubai municipality. And many green communities in Dubai have that. So now the challenge becomes, how do I offer the greatest green spaces with a minimal uh, treated sewage effluent requirement. There's a cost to that, remember. Treated sewage effluent was originally sweet water. It got pumped somewhere, it got treated, it got returned to us. So there's a cost involved, right? So a lot of greenery that we see is perhaps not very sustainable. If you switch off the water for a few days in August, what's going to happen? 
So we really have to choose the right landscape. And also for us, a landscape, back to the cultural value, is not only the aesthetics. You know, we're all, I think, tempted by the aesthetics. But uh, the landscape is really part of our culture and our space, and it's also a productive landscape. So what we try to do is introduce the concept that something green can actually produce food and fiber for us. So we have papyrus along an open water environment. We have date palms producing 40 tons or 40,000 kilograms of dates per year. The, the papyrus is important. Like it, it's, it's a kind of a filter. It's a natural filter for the water, so isn't the it? So water, the open water environment that you may I see between... I think we can click into the next slide. Uh, it won't be... Yeah, there you go. Uh, these are the six pillars for us of environmental sustainability as a developer. So we need to focus on food. We believe a city has to produce food. Energy, great challenge, great story and opportunities. Technology, I think, is, is helping. Uh, water management, the, the building materials, mobility, electrification, uh, car sharing, and then waste management. When it comes to water, that open water environment that you see, that's treated sewage effluent. If you, we sit there, we, we sit around that lake, which contains treated sewage effluent, and we have picnics, and we have ducks, and we have kids walking. It's completely safe. And that water is actually pumped through an irrigation network and, and irrigates the farm and the ring road around the city. And of course, we have to comply with Dubai municipality regulations. We test the water, etc. But the point is this. How do we maximize the use of treated sewage effluent? We have to respect it. This was actually seawater desalinated with a large energy footprint. So how do we make the best use of it? And if we switch off the water, do we have plants in place that, gonna, that are going to capture that moisture and sustain the greenery, as we say, the aesthetics. Mm. And if you're able to walk around in Dubai and then actually harvest some fruits, we also have hives in the community, beehives, not to produce honey, but to pollinate the landscape, because our landscape needs to be pollinated, and we need to move away from pesticides as much as possible, because they suppress bees and insect populations. So we really have to think of it holistically, right? It's not just sketching a beautiful landscape. Let's tie it to the people, let's connect it to the bees, let's connect it to the water. That's where sustainability lies. Absolutely. Stephen? Yeah. <clears throat> I was just going to speak to that whole systems approach. Yeah. And mindset you mentioned earlier, Jason touched on it as well. The whole notion that um, needing to move beyond the criteria of a financial return as far as criteria for how we measure value, how we estimate value. Because until um, the value of green, the psychology that green generates comes into it, then everything's been measured about, uh, well, do we use the water for this or that based on a financial The measure. bottom line. It's but always about the bottom line. But we have, on the to, bottom line. Yeah, we have to redefine abundance, don't yeah. we? What does that actually mean? Yep. It's not just economic. Yeah, and I'm certainly with Jason in terms of moving beyond triple bottom line accounting, which is people, planet, profit, but looking at knowledge, technology, health and well-being, experience as other potential measures of value. And then you start to play with that holistic system and rebalance the whole thing uh, appropriately. So yes, I mean, it's an interesting uh, dynamic. How do you actually deploy resources within a community to get that right balance? And some of the things, some of the other research I've um, witnessed in terms of green, uh, some incredible stuff around how the health and um, improvement in health of people in hospitals has been tested where uh, the same people undergoing the same operation have an outlook into a city or an outlook into a garden or park landscape. And the people looking out into the park landscape are recovering twice as quickly as the people who are looking at a built environment other research where they've um, put greenery into prisons, into maximum security prisons, and measured the uh, obvious level of violence without and the level of violence with. And the level of violence massively diminishes just by having greenery within the, that context. There's another great experiment that I saw somebody do where they actually had a, um, a mobile platform with a plant on it that was hooked up to sensors, and as people walked past the platform with the plant on it, the plant would follow them down the, down the corridor. So this whole notion that we, we um, are somehow detached from nature 
is quite bizarre when you start seeing such practical examples of how plants respond so immediately to the health and well-being of people. So let's take a, a look at the Australian example then, Stephen. How do we re-engineer our societies then to take advantage of that and to make our spaces, you know, greener and, and more that, um, you know, like Dr. Mahmoud uh, put up that quote, like a party that nobody wants to leave. So how do we do that? Well, it's interesting. We were talking about government policy beforehand and, you know, there's obviously a huge role for government to play in defining what value is. Mm. And so long as government doesn't value um, green, then it's very difficult to push to uh, uh, introduce more green into the environment. So definitely in terms of the mindset shift, it's as much in government as it is anywhere and moving beyond just that immediate um, self-interest uh, uh, mindset that drives a lot of Western governments to look at the short-term uh, the short-term goals, the maintaining of power at all costs um, to maintain that position is degrading the values across the board. So we end up with a very distorted set of, uh, of values that are based on immediate returns, um, election cycles, and so that long-term investment in society, culture and the environment just get lost. Yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting to hear some of the comments that, uh, of the initiatives in uh, this part of the world, in the Middle East, in the Emirates, and that real focus on uh, government leadership and policy to ensure that that broader concept of value is maintained. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I, I want to come back to you, Dr. Mahmoud, uh, in, in terms of, um, you know, the idea of abundance. Uh, how do we need to redefine it and, and how do we change societies to fit that model? Well, what we've been seeing from the research we've been doing here in Dubai, at least, is that we want to have the buy-in of people to believe in the sustainability. And this is uh, really something that we find very challenging. We have here in the United Arab Emirates a Ministry for Climate Change. We have uh, a national committee on SDGs that is trying to bring the private sector and the, the communities. But we see lack of understanding of sustainability. In real estate, for example, when we ask real estate investors and tenants uh, if sustainability or green buildings mean anything to you, they say, actually, we don't care about it, 99%. We only care if it makes economic sense. And here is, uh, and I remember talking to Faris, the CEO of the Sustainable City. He said, Mahmoud, I, I thought of environment second to economy. First, we need to make economic sense of what we're doing. We cannot sell sustainability if it doesn't make economic sense. We cannot sell sustainability if it doesn't lead to uh, economic profits. And this is why when we talk about abundance, we should, uh, I mean, relax our understanding of sustainability as avoidance of depletion of resources to think of how we use technology like artificial intelligence, the fourth industrial revolution, all kind of new technologies to produce more rather than of thinking of let's harm less, let's reduce the depletion of resources. No, we want a new system paradigm, a new thinking of where we get all the stakeholders part of it. I mean, this is something we would love to see, especially in the, this region. And I wanted to add to what I started with that we have 25, 30% of the Arab youth who are unemployed. How we want them to think of sustainability if they don't have the basic thing of feeding themselves. As DG number eight is about economic growth and job creation. Where is that? Uh, the poverty, the, uh, the, the, the wars and everything. So w we have to think of sustainability as a system, as 17 sustainable development goals. Each one is important. We cannot achieve sustainability if we lack an economy. We cannot live if we don't have the social sustainability. So I think what we're doing is a great start. What we need to build in is more of going down to, to people, to communities, to, and I'm very hopeful to see the, 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 the young generations. We, we have a Greta from Sweden who started the uh, strike, climate strike in schools and millions of people joined it. So we see now the millennials, the young generations are leading the way to sustainability. We need to support, empower them to do more of that. We absolutely do, 100%. And Dr. Jason. Actually, I'd I'd love to add on that. I mean, I think actually millennials and Gen Z are actually uh, the real sort of uh, climate change, climate sort of change sort of pioneers to try and make a difference now. And they are 
they are wearing the green agenda as a badge of pride and are wanting to try and make a difference, which is great. Now, what's interesting also is that, let's, let's just take the smart agenda for one instance as well, and I'll try and weave the two together and I hope you can keep up. But basically, if you think about how smart cities were originally conceived, very technology driven, very economy focused, very big corporations rubbing shoulders with government saying, let's make a smart city, let's you know, spur the national economy, and ultimately this becomes a very top-down, government-driven approach. Now, what we see in the further generations of a smart city is a slightly more nuanced, smarter kind of view, where it is very much empowered by millennials and Gen Zs. Now, let's take Bandung as a classic example. If you were to compare Bandung and, say, Songdo. Songdo in Korea, Generation 1 smart city, government-driven, technology-driven, ultimately focused on the economy, making North Asian economic growth. Great. But Bandung was all about the mayor basically saying to millennials and Gen Zs, speak to me, use Twitter, use Facebook. If you've got a problem with your city, tell me about it. And my digital command center will sift through trending topics, and I'll find the root cause, and I'll fix it. So the algorithms sift through trending topics like pollution, crime, flooding, and the mayor is able to deploy his resources wisely and on time. Not just blanketing the city with police cars and ambulances and firefighters. No, he's deploying the resources wisely. And all of a sudden, the Gen Zs and the millennials and the people who really care about the city and the green agenda are thinking, the government is actually listening to me and is actually making a difference. It's and so I think that city, now, in the third generation smart city, yeah. we're seeing the link between people power and the government, and they are really trying to focus on making a smarter and sustainable city. And ultimately, these are all tags, right? You know, the, the, the sustainability and smart are very commonly used words. I think actually they're both very, very much related. And I, I would far rather be talking about sustainable development goals than actually trying to pigeonhole things into smart or sustainable. But I think that we are seeing a breakthrough now. And I think, back to the point, millennials and Gen Zs, I actually think are the future. Yeah, yeah. Um, Karim. Uh, just on the issue of smart as well, you hear me? Yeah. Uh, there's also the notion of passive smart. So, yes, I appreciate technology. And, and Dubai is hosting so many uh, exhibitions which promote and pitch and showcase technologies, good for energy, good for water, etc. But passive smart is also something we have to embrace, which is what forefathers used to do. I'll give you one or two examples. In this part of the world, the smartest thing to do is to avoid the sun when we build. Yes, we have an abundance, going back to that, of sun, which is fantastic for renewable energy and reducing our carbon footprint in the future. But if we build by avoiding the sun, if we build our narrow streets to cast the shade on them, to provide, to encourage people to spend more time outdoors, this is the smartest thing we can do at the level of the city. And that doesn't have anything to do with technology. It's just about avoiding the sun. In, in Korea and China, they're going to do the opposite. We had a delegation from Bangladesh a few days ago, housing, social housing. For them, they have to avoid the West because of monsoon rains and winds. So obviously, every country, every geography has its own restrictions and opportunities. So let's always remember, before we consider technology, let's try to be passive smart, if possible. One of the examples that I like as well from the sustainable city that you have is the way that you, that you plant your fruit trees. You plant them under the date palms just so that they won't be scorched by the sun. So in, in Egypt, this, the, the inspiration comes from Oasis in the UAE, but I think Egypt is perhaps a more vivid example if you've been to some, some of the Wahat, you know, the oasis, the, the farmlands of Egypt, 5,000 years ago, they would have, it's called the three tiers. So they have the date palms, tw 10 to 15 meters tall, casting their shade on the second tier, palm granite and olive trees, and they cast their shade on parsley, tomatoes, cucumber, etc. 
that's, a, that's an ecosystem, and within it, you're going to have birds, and you're going to have reptiles, etc. So how can we recreate that? And that's what we've tried to it's do so to some extent. It's so it, it's simple. It's so simple, but right? It's, it's amazing. It is, it is simple. Technology will assist, right? It's an enabling, it's an enabler, but it's not the solution on its own. Jason. Uh, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, when I think about, um, I, a few years ago, I did a show called City Time Traveller, and I was looking at different cities around the world and what makes their architecture unique to that particular region. And what I found was that it was almost like um, Darwin's theory of evolution. It's the, the survival of the smartest design ideas that are born out of the culture and the climate. And so basically, you can go to Thailand, and you can kind of sense the humidity, you can feel the prevailing southwesterly winds, you know that there is monsoon, and so the architecture that is created responds to the climate, but it also responds to the social and cultural practices of the people. Those ideas still survive because it's almost like this Darwinian theory, the survival of the fittest. The strongest design ideas tend to remain. And so I think that there is a way that we should be looking at our past, the traditional architecture, as the spirit of future architecture. It forms the basis of it. When I think about the you know, the, the, the sense of the, the courtyard orientated spaces in Middle Eastern architecture that allows for natural light, natural ventilation, whether it's the tropical climate, kampong houses of Malaysia that are long, elongated, provide for, again, natural light, natural ventilation, or even the houses of, say, Sweden, which were vernacular timber, stone base, compact to keep the heat in. All of these lessons of the past can actually help influence the future designs of sustainable buildings. It's incredible. I mean, even here in, in the UAE, the Burjil Tower, you know, there are so many design elements that, you know, uh, speak to the environment and, and harness that, which is incredible. But in the last couple of minutes, let's talk about uh, the sustainable cities of the future. Dr. Mahmoud, um, I, I want to hear from you a little bit about, you know, what inspires you and what you want to see further. And, and we'll move along uh, our speakers here. Sorry, I didn't uh, hear the last part. The sustainable cities of the future, what you would like to see, what you're inspired by looking all over the world. Well, I would love to have the city that I said, uh, walkable, bikeable, yes. cities that has uh, everything for everyone, economically growing, uh, innovatively driven, mm. youth are leading it, the right governance, the right cooperation between government, private sector, people. Uh, we want to have healthy cities because the environment where we're living affect our life. And as we said, we spend also 90% of our time indoors. So in new technologies and stuff that uh, makes the exposure to unhealthy stuff less and less, we want to, ha to live a healthy life, friendly life, safe life, secure. Yeah. Less of cars, I'm a big believer that we should have less of cars. We really love it when we go outside and travel and we walk all the time, we walk for hours and hours. We want to have a strong public transport uh, system yes. that makes cars less and less needed. Uh, this is the kind of uh, city I want it to be safe for my kids and the generations and our kids and the generations to come. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Stephen, uh, in terms of cities around the world, sustainable cities that inspire you. Uh, well, I think in terms of what I would aspire to would be to try and create places that empower individuals to live a fully realised life. Mm -hmm. And that needs a holistic approach. And when I look at um, nature, so much of what has been um, investigated today is really about how do we mimic nature because nature occurs in a very effortless way. It evolves effortlessly, it's decentralised, it's agile, it is adaptable. And I think that's what we're trying to create in um, the places that I'm involved with. It's more about not so much the form or the function typically of buildings but more the intention. What do we want as the intention for a place to be able to create. And that comes down to a set of shared values and a vision and a mission that start to speak to how do we empower people yeah. to live inspired lives. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the kind of, just a little bit of, the, of the, the kind of innovations we need to see to make that happen. 
I think, well, again, it comes back to that shifting mindset. So as long as there's only one measure of value, then mm. we get a certain outcome and we'll just continue to get those outcomes. So okay. until they, um, you know, we, we embrace a broader series of criteria that, that talk to health and well-being and inspiring and empowering people, we're going to get the same sort of outcome. So there's a whole mind shift that really needs yeah. to occur into this new paradigm of empowering people rather than just, uh, at the moment we're providing places for people to exist. Yeah. You know, how do we inspire people to um, uh, realise in the world? Exactly. Karim, uh, for you, you guys have achieved so much already, but what are you looking forward to now? What's next? Well, I started by saying that uh, I used to uh, uh, see cities as the culprit, right? the bad in the world. And they still are, they still are. The planet is, is really at risk because of how cities have grown. But now I see cities more as the opportunity to uh, achieve some of the sustainable development goals, not just SDG 11, but also the Paris Agreement. So I think all of us, we need to position cities, in, starting from us as well, the sustainable city, in that continuum of emissions and climate change. So today we have the knowledge we have this is where we are we have the technology i think we have the mindset we have to a certain extent the attitude to transform cities into from a, a burden a cost burden a carbon burden to really being a carbon sink and where we can begin to adopt the principles of circularity so we need to think of sustainable cities and communities around the world as Entities which are viable with minimal inputs from governments and utilities, eventually perhaps off-grid, eventually. But we should not be, we should no longer be a burden on the state and a burden on a municipality. On the contrary, we have to be the opportunity. And then down to the people level, I see two areas that all of us are going to witness, we're going to witness great changes in, and those are mobility. Uh, I, I just came back from Barcelona. I hadn't been there in 10 years, and I've, I've seen a city transformed from a congested city to very few cars on the streets today, likewise in Copenhagen and other cities. So mobility is really changing and transforming the way we move from A to B. And then food production. I think we have to think of cities, and that's what we would like to see, as also a space where we can produce food and support food security. Today we don't talk about agricultural development, we talk about food security. It, we should no longer depend on those lengthy, wasteful supply lines, supply chains from all over the world just to feed us. We have to be part of that food production equation, and I see cities as playing a vital role in achieving that. Amazing, absolutely vital. Uh, Professor Jason, uh, last but not least, uh, you have so many thoughts uh, around the innovations that we need to see in the cities of, of the future. I'd love to hear your thoughts. How long have I got? Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I think for me, um, nothing sharpens the mind greater than a cataclysmic climate change related activity. And all of a sudden, things suddenly get people focused. I think back in um, Tahikashi Matsushima in Japan, the Fukushima precinct, the nuclear reactor melted down, we see a great tsunami that effectively tilted the earth on its axes by five degrees. That is the power of that sort of climate change related tsunami. Now, that sharpened the mindset of the Japanese and the community to basically push for energy deregulation, a move away from nuclear power, an embrace of solar and renewable energies. It also sharpened the mindset of the individuals to think about a culture of resilience. And I think that we're gonna see more of that in the future with other climate change related activities. We're gonna definitely see it in Venice. And I mean, what I find kind of slightly perverse interesting at the same time is that the earth is made up of two-thirds water and ultimately maybe blue is the new green because with that surface area there is an opportunity for alternative forms of urbanization
There are so many dockyards that have become derelict. As we move away from a manufacturing-based economy to a digital economy, these ports and docks that have already had an element of environmental degradation can be given a new lease of life that can provide alternative forms of urbanization and cheaper forms of real estate. We see it in Eiberg in Amsterdam. We see it in Chongnyas in Cambodia. We're seeing a lot more of these sort of developments in the future. And I think I maybe... I love what you designed. Sorry, I'm, I'm just going to jump in here. But the boats that you designed that kind of when it's peak time... Oh, yeah. You know, they uh, are Could huge, and then they, they can... Yeah. You so just, do you describe what they so, can So do? basically, the, the autonomous boats that are yes. actually able to have conversations with each other, link together, form bridges, or disperse and sort of move around the city oh, yeah. as a movable platform. If you've got automated cars, why can't you have automated boats within canals and other river settings? So I think you know, it goes back to your point about mobility. I think mobility yes. is incredibly important, and it's not just waterborne mobility. It's also air mobility. Driverless, uh, we see driverless taxis, but Volocopter from Germany have just trialed a passenger drone in Singapore about a month ago. So I think that there are some really remarkable changes, but for me, my money is on actually water, because I think that we can explore air rights 50 to 100 years from now, but at the moment, I think waterborne rights are equally important as an alternative means of urbanization. And then, as long as they can be climate change resilient, so that they can actually rise with sea levels, just like what we see in the Bangkok floating market, or Chongnyas in Cambodia, or Eiberg in Amsterdam, then I think we are moving towards interesting waterborne communities. An amazing discussion with these four fantastic speakers. I wonder if anybody's got any questions for them. Yes, sir. Do we have a, a microphone for the gentleman so that we can hear him? Yep. There's one coming around here. Thank you so, thank you so much to the panelists. Uh, Dr. Musa, and uh, thank you. Uh, they showed a picture of my, the city from where I'm from, uh, the three-wheeler getting drowned in the city. And it is second worst city uh, livable uh, from the bottom, Dhaka. But it wasn't like that. 40 years ago, the difference between Kuala Lumpur, Dhaka, and Bangkok wasn't that much. But in 40, 40, 40 years, look at the paradox. It's now one of the worst livable city, but it is one of the richest city. The per square feet or per square meter price of the real estate is uh, equal to top 10 cities of the world. Now, this is one of the paradox. We made the city rich, but not smart and sustainable. That's one uh, paradox. That's, uh, secondly, the mobility. It's like only six kilometers per hour. But look at, look at what happened. It has urbanized over the years, but, uh, but we didn't make the link between uh, the urban studies and regional planning. So as much as the city is growing, none of the university or the, the country doesn't have any study called urban studies or regional planning. So I think that the, the city's problem cannot be, the solution is not within the heart, unless there are some other solutions from the periphery, that you link it with other uh, conglomerates, that you can make the center city, the capital city, or some of the cornerstone. Final observation is that there was a study done between the people or residents of New York in comparison to some of the bedroom cities or bedroom community of the inner United States. They found out that the people in the New York have two things on very high, the neurologic disorder, blood pressure, and cranky, <laughs> a bit higher compared to people who are in the inland. So the density, the urban agglomeration, not only had an impact of sustainability, but also on the public health. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, anybody have a question? Yes, sir. Hi, we're talking about the technology, and I think we're overcomplicating ourselves with the technology when we design cities. If we have a look back, and this is what uh, uh, Karim said, look back to the desert, let us say, and look back how did the cities 100 years ago, how were they, they were living. They were living with their simple tools, but they were you know, using the materials that they built their houses with, the spaces that they designed the houses with. You look at the old Baghdad, let us say. Look at the old Cairo. And even if you look at the uh, places where they, the desert is dominant, how they used to live with the tents and the air circulation is simple. So yeah. 
Innovation is, when we use the technology, my opinion is innovation uh, requires simplicity, not complication. Yes. So yes. I think there is a lot of, if, we, if I look at the sustainable city, I look at some great ideas there, but I look at, if you look at the solar panels, they're, 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 they're doing a good job, but they're, you know, again, we're, we're, we're putting them for AC and we're putting them for uh, complicated technologies, not, not simplified. Thank you. More uh, observations rather than questions. Anybody actually have a, a question for our panel before we wrap up? No? No question? We, we covered quite a bit. It was pretty incredible. So, uh, yes? You have a question? Hi, I'm uh, Omar from Sudan. So my question is, uh, I'm going to take you to a different country, different geography. So you have a remote area in Sudan. You have mm. uh, plenty of water resources, rain, uh, and, 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 and water in the ground itself. You have a, a moderately good uh, soil. So in order to establish such a uh, um, a foundation for a sustainable city and you have these resources. How far do you think we are from having technologies like solar power available to um, underdeveloped areas such as uh, Darfur, for example? Thank you. Yep, yeah. Kerry. Kerry, yeah. Um, I, I think uh, s renewable energy is something we, we must all adopt, right? Perhaps I didn't emphasize the point and the importance of a zero energy society, development, project, etc. And now, and we have uh, two axes of intervention. So at the level of Khartoum, for example, it could be utility level solar or hydro, in your case as well, or wind. And at the level of a community, we talk about distributed solar. and small-scale CSP, concentrated solar, etc. So we have two things that can support one another. Utility can do the big investment and diversify their energy mix. And then communities, developers, uh, individuals, investors can actually invest in distributed solar. And I think you, your question was, when can we see that? I think if you look at the numbers, it has become exceptionally, extraordinarily cheap today and cost effective to install solar, it is actually cheaper than the lowest tariff slab by Diwa today in Dubai. In Khartoum, I'm sure you have a different context, but I think the metrics still apply. And it is still dropping. I think we're, we're approaching the bottom of, of pricing. But remember, it's, we're going to mix it up with some wind. We're going to mix it with CSP, uh, geothermal, etc. It's only a matter of time. And it's not for the rich, again. The renewable energy, I would argue, is for the poor or the people who need it the most. And then you have programs like uh, Acon Lighting Africa, etc. You have many great initiatives, Bill Gates, etc., providing solar to distant remote communities throughout Africa. It's happening. It's happening. And I think Sudan, you have an abundance of resources, and you can make that happen for much of the Arab world, actually. Just before we wrap up, I'm just reminded of a story, uh, Jason, that you shared about the affordability of building sustainably, uh, because you actually built Trump Tower in Manila. Uh, and yeah. uh, <laughs> as well, well as... Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's interesting because... Uh, they didn't want. They didn't want it to be. They didn't care about oh. that. But actually, yeah, that was painful. You managed to, to save so much money in, yeah. in that way anyway. I don't know whether my microphone's been cut can, off on can purpose. Can we just turn it back um, on very quickly? <laughs> Sorry, it's okay. Um, oh, uh, yeah. Well, first of all, um, it always makes me laugh when a developer says to me, um, "We're going to first of all." start cost-cutting all of the green features because that is going to be what's really expensive. But actually, I, I would like to try and talk about this like caveman and cavewoman sitting at the mouth of a cave. Now, once upon a time, caveman and cavewoman were sitting there getting natural light and natural ventilation, then they discovered fire. And they moved the fire inside the cave to illuminate, to cook, to provide warmth. Now, the problem is that we have become so technology obsessed, that we've moved deeper inside the cave for millennia. We need, to you know, we need to return ourselves to the mouth of the cave. Embrace natural light, embrace natural ventilation, use locally sourced materials, and that's actually helping reduce costs. Mm. The renewable energies that we put in, geothermal, wind turbine technology, solar, these are great 
product to help offset our demand. And I would say that carbon zero is good. Carbon negative, so that we become power stations to support the community, will be even more important. And I agree. Your country is perfect, so rich in terms of being able to embrace the natural environment. And so, to counter this Trump thing, because, yeah, we had on the one hand, we had this big tall building where they weren't really interested in sustainability, but actually we were. We still managed to reduce energy and water consumption by 50%. But we've also done houses where the client has said, we want to have a carbon negative home, but, oh, thank you, a carbon negative home, it generates more energy than it can consume, but it has to be at the same cost as an average house. By going through the passive design principles of natural light, natural ventilation, locally sourced materials, getting the orientation right, you are saving money there. And then you use the, the, the renewable energies and technologies sparingly. And we came in under budget. We came in under the cost of a conventional home. And we're now doing these as affordable homes in Pakistan. We're doing it in Philippines. And so ultimately, I completely agree, sustainable design is economic design, yeah. and it should be affordable design that the community can enjoy. Incredible. It is all happening and it's all coming in the future. I want to thank our incredible panel. Thank you so much, Karim Jusser, Stephen Haggard, Professor Jason Pomeroy, and Dr. Mahmoud Al Bare. Please join me in thanking them so much. And thank you all for being here at this session. Thank you, Sunny, so much. Thank you. Thank you.